the BBC have made the world's best ever natural history programme. There is no organisation that comes near. The BBC have a natural history unit in Bristol, and they have produced the most dynamic and memorable and unique, amazing, informative documentaries. I mean, just look at the, the quality of the work that they regularly produce. They are utterly extraordinary. There is nobody who comes near. And of course, it's David Attenborough, whom I know quite well and respect enormously. It's David Attenborough who has become the world icon who presents programmes. And when we've been together, we've been snapped. Uh, on this occasion, I was presenting him with uh, an award. Uh, we met at dinners, we meet sometimes at conferences, we meet socially. And more often than not, of course, as is always the way, you will see us simply having a laugh. And it's a curious thing that when science, and particularly microbiology and the biosciences are on television, you never see anybody laugh. They're always terribly precious <laughs> and serious and down to earth and, and rather like, like um, preachers or philosophers. They hardly ever even break a tiny smile. And yet we know that when we meet and when we do our science, we're a laugh a minute. And the public gets an entirely spurious <laughs> idea of what you are actually like. So what David certainly does. When we first started out, there was so much of the natural world we were unable to film. The cameras, the lighting, the size of the equipment, all meant that the extremely small, the very large, the ultra-fast, or the infinitesimally slow, were beyond our reach. In the last 30 years, things have changed out of all recognition. We can now film everything, from the giants of the world's oceans to the smallest invertebrates. Now that's interesting. Notice what David said. And remember, he's reading from a script. He's been encouraged by the director to say what he should say. The words are David's, but the thoughts and the editorialization is the director's. And he said how 30 years ago we couldn't do half of this stuff. How now we can film everything down to the smallest thing. And that now is possible. Then wasn't possible. And yet he skates around the fact that there is this incredible gap. Because the BBC has now acquired this archive of life, but there is nothing to do with microbes anywhere in their output. Nothing at all. If you log on to the BBC, they've got an entire site <coughs> which is devoted to the various categories of things that they have filmed over the years. You can click onto them even to see the cat. And you see we go simpler and simpler, down past the cephalopods, spiders and mites and their allies, down and down to more, as we would regard them, uh, taxonomically lowly and simpler forms. And so you get to the very bottom of the, of the final page with sea urchins and polychaete worms. No nematodes, of course, because they'd be possibly microscopic. So when you get to polychaete worms, which are actually not simple creatures at all, and that's where it ends. If you click on algae, the only alga they've got is the giant kelp, which can be 150 feet long. If you want to see the sexual excitements of Spirogyra in the autumn, if you want to see Clavidomonas fighting with its friends for food, then I'm afraid you will be disappointed. They simply aren't there. They just miss them out. They just do not exist. This is the piece I published in, in Nature when we, we showed how Robert Brown's observations were done, and those of you who didn't fall asleep at the time, will remember my description of all of this at Intermicro in the uh, 1980s, again, uh, 30 years ago. Now, this research is all over the place. Everybody now knows how Brown did his work. It's in books, it's encyclopedias, and if you Google it, up comes this Ford research with boring and unimaginable 
monopolies <laughs> everywhere you look, until, of course, until the BBC decided they would lurch unsteadily into this territory. And they produced a program <coughs> that, that, you notice it's, it's titled Knowledge. The BBC now have a department of knowledge. They have a head of knowledge, George Entwistle, who earns a third of a million dollars a year for doing his job. And this is what I, the sharp intake of breath from the envious Americans in, in my life. <laughs> and, and this was a series about the atom. And they decided that they would include Robert Brown's research in it. And I, it was odd, because I knew they were making this program, but we never had a phone call or an email. And this, ladies and gentlemen, do make sure that your, um, your seat backs and train tables are returned to the upright and locked position, and that your seat belts are firmly fastened, because this really will produce an effect on what you think of science on television. In 1827, a Scottish botanist called Robert Brown sprinkled pollen grains in some water and examined it through a microscope. What he found was really strange because instead of the pollen grains floating gently in the water, they danced around furiously, almost as though they were alive. For nearly 80 years, Brown's discovery remained a little-known scientific anomaly. Then, Einstein changed everything. In one staggering insight, Einstein saw that Brownian motion was all about atoms. The pollen will only jiggle if they were being jostled by something else. So, Einstein said that the water must be made of tiny atom-like particles, which themselves are jiggling and are continually buffeting the pollen. If there were no atoms, then the pollen would stay still. Now, dear Jim Al Khalifi, from beginning to end, has given a complete load of, a, a completely <laughs> misleading, a completely misleading account. Firstly, the pollen grains don't move; it's the particles inside the pollen grains. Secondly, he didn't sprinkle it on a fish tank; he put it on a slide under his microscope. Thirdly, the microscope is not being used in the way that Brown would have been using it, and indeed it is a modern microscope when Brown looked through the microscope. And the piece of video that you saw earlier is clearly of particles of Indian ink photographed under oil immersion or something of the sort, and has no relationship to Brown, has no relationship to pollen, has no relationship to Brown's microscope or anything he did in the 1820s. And finally, we have expensively commissioned graphic art which actually shows pollen grains moving about in a way that they never, ever did. It completely amazes me that if, for example, they're going to make a period drama and a ringed dove, a collared dove, comes and sings in the background, they had to, to take the shot again because that species wasn't in Britain at the time that Bronte was writing her novels. If they're doing a reconstruction of some, some drama and a steam train comes along, they have to make sure they've got the sound of it with the right steam locomotive or people will write it in their hundreds and complain. But with science, with the microscope, you can say any complete drivel that you wish because the public are so disenfranchised from it, there is nobody watching who's going to correct them. Now, Layman Hook is a good case in point, and I advise you to watch this. Also, please note that when Hans Lonker, who is well known to many of us as a manufacturer of uh, replicas, I never met Hans, though we, we've often emailed in the past, uh, and do notice that when the presenter says, so what am I looking at here? That he says, at the wrong side, which I must admit is one of the great moments in this program. <laughs> <laughs> and they were a staggering 247 microscopes. A new one every couple of months for over 50 years. And told nobody how he made them. We've placed a drop of lake water onto a slide that slots into the device. With a bit of luck, I'll be able to see what Van Leeuwenhoek saw. What, what do I actually do? Where am I looking? Uh, at the wrong side. You <laughs> 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 see green? There is a focusing knob. There's a focus? Yes, there is a focusing knob. Uh, this might be made... So I can move it actually away, away from my uh, eye. This one. This is the focus. Let me try and help. Yeah, that works. That really works. It's now in focus. Oh, wow! Oh my god, you can actually see moving... 
creatures. Yes. Oh God, that's incredible. <laughs> There's a tiny, tiny bug in there, which is scooting around, which I guess is a protozoa. That's astonishing. Tiny, tiny bug in there, scooting around. He's very good on the descriptive science. <laughs> now, what is interesting about that sequence is that those chlorophyte filaments that you could see, and the little protozoan or rotifer, whichever it was, they were not actually as clearly seen in the shot as they are to the naked eye. If you get a little bit of pond water in a fire and look at it, just look at it, damn it, and you will see the organisms clearer. The resolution, though, not the magnification, the resolution is greater. And knowing how much money the BBC had spent on this ridiculous series, I thought, how cheaply could you do it? So I once picked up at a Target store a 99 cent webcam. It's only VGA resolution. <laughs> it has a very low refresh rate. And so I took the same kind of algae and the same kind of microorganisms, and this was the result that we got. <laughs> so this experiment cost 99 cents, ladies and gentlemen. And of course you can see the algal filaments quite clearly. Uh, and you can make out the organisms inside very well. I mean, this kind of lamentable ignorance is so utterly extraordinary. And it terrifies me to think that the public are being fed a conti continuing drip, drip diet of this negative and ill-informed and ludicrous view. In fact, we're being so caught up with molecular biology and genetics. Genetics, of course, has done so much to tell us about who we are and where we came from and what we might die of. It has done nothing whatever to cure anybody very much of anything. I mean, the, the, the great opening of vistas of new therapies that, that everybody was assured would follow, which is why we were pumping billions into, into the field, has simply failed to eventuate. But people never think of living things anymore because they don't see sites like this and this wasn't sh taken through a hans Lonka replica microscope but through a times 20 lens from a victorian botanical microscope mm. a really cheap lens i mean a really cheap lens and the 99 cents camera and the results there are a thousand times better than the results the bbc managed to obtain if you want to allow me to show off for just one little moment using a single lens microscope properly this is Stardonichia. This is a single lens microscope. This is one lens the size of the head of a pin, ladies and gentlemen. The amount of chromatic aberration is minimal, and I invite you to just look at that beautiful view. That is what Leeuwenhoek could see. Now, this is an extraordinary revelation. This is a quite majestic sight, is it not? And yet, this is what the television won't show you because they are so detached from this area of knowledge. I mean, the point of having a department of knowledge is presumably, firstly, to have knowledge, <laughs> secondly, <laughs> to have people who've got knowledge, and thirdly, to tell people who haven't got knowledge to go and get some. <laughs> if it doesn't do those things, I'm at a loss to know what it's there for.